Hey guys and welcome back, or if you're new around here, hi, my name's Georgia and on my platforms are on the internet, I talk about true crime. Today I've got the story of Lauren Agee for you, a 21 year old woman who mysteriously died whilst at a weekend festival with her friends. She was found floating face down in the water. This is one of those very frustrating cases where law enforcement have just written off. As far as officials are concerned, this was an open and shut case, a tragic accident. But to this day, there are so many unanswered questions surrounding Lauren's death, and many experts feel like it was just written off too quickly. There's evidence this could be a homicide. So why was this angle never looked at? Is there something hiding under the surface here? Well, that's what we're going to explore today. Maybe this really was an accident, maybe the authorities have been correct all along in this case, but seeing as they didn't do, self-admittedly didn't do any investigation, how can they truly come to that conclusion? If they'd been able to tie up all the loose ends, provide all the answers, maybe Lauren's family wouldn't still be fighting for answers today. But they're right to have questions because as you'll come to see, there are a lot of things in this case that just don't make any sense. And a lot of very sketchy behaviour from the friends Lauren went to the festival with that weekend. Lauren Taylor Agee was just 21 years old in her second year of college where she studied criminal science. She was at the peak of her life, she was living every day to the fullest, she'd just got a new boyfriend who she was absolutely besotted with, and her friends and family described her as vibrant and vivacious, the kind of person you were always going to notice in any room. Whatever the opposite of a wallflower is, like that was Lauren. She could chat to anyone and she always made her presence known. Her family described her in a Crime Watch Daily episode about this case as just a ball of fire. Lauren's greatest love in life was dance. She'd been dancing since childhood and she'd won more competitions than you could possibly count. Even as a college student, she was still dancing. It was just kind of her lifeblood. Family said she was just constantly dancing, whether she was waiting in line at the store or watching music videos on TV, just copying the moves on screen. She did that from childhood all the way through to when she died. I always liked going to these episodes giving you a really good idea of who these victims were. I think in a lot of true crime cases, the victims do kind of get lost in the narrative, but Lauren was just so full of life. She needs to be at the center of her own story. I have no doubt that her loss has just left a huge hole in her family. She was living at home with her mum and sister in Tennessee at the time she died. So in the summer of 2015, even though she was 21, Lauren approached her mum Sherry and asked if she could go to Wakefest. I found Wakefest described online as a community outreach event designed to promote the sport of wakeboarding. So basically professional and amateur wakeboarders take place in a grassroots tournament on the water and every year over 2,000 spectators turn up to support during the day and then party at night. And I get the feeling that for people in Lauren's circle maybe, or maybe for just teenagers and young adults generally in this area, Wakefest was kind of one of those rite of passages, like it's summer, you go to Wakefest, you get drunk, and you party through the night with your friends. It's a three day festival located at Centre Hill Lake, just two hours outside of Nashville. The idea is that overnight people stay in the cabins and houseboats dotted around the marina, and it seems that's what Lauren kind of assumed that she was doing when she went with her friends but that wasn't really what her friends had in mind. So Lauren was originally invited to attend Wakefest with a friend called Samantha, but that plan fell through and there just basically wasn't enough space for her in the car. I have a feeling there was some sort of like young girl politics involved in this. So instead, Lauren goes with a childhood friend of hers called Hannah. And upon telling Sherry this, that this is who she planned to go with, Sherry said she was immediately quite concerned because apparently Hannah was one of those friends who sort of dipped in and out of Lauren's life. When Hannah had a boyfriend, she'd generally just disappear and she'd only make an effort with Lauren when she needed something. So Sherry just generally wasn't the biggest fan of Hannah as a friend. But I'm sure lots of us can relate to our mums not liking our friends. Mums have that experience, they can see things that you can't see when you're like in it as a young adult. I've had so many friends that my mum didn't like and I thought she was just being silly at the time, but now I'm almost 30, I actually see it. Don't tell my mum I said that though. But when you're young, you just don't care. You're just in it for fun. You're desperate to fit in. You don't care if your friends aren't the best people in the world. Like you're just living your life. Lauren was happy to go off for a weekend with Hannah. But she wasn't just going with Hannah because they were also going with Hannah's boyfriend, Aaron, and Aaron's friend, Chris, neither of whom it seems like Lauren had ever met before. 
As I said before, Lauren did have a boyfriend, I think he was called Chase, who she was very smitten with. So she didn't go to Wakefest with these boys with any intentions, this wasn't a double date situation. She was just going to hang out with her friends and have fun and the boys just happened to be there. Maybe there was a slight wing womaning situation going on, maybe she was helping Hannah out, but she was just happy to go along with everyone. But perhaps if she knew their plans for a sleeping situation, she might have changed her mind. So she told Sherry that they were staying in one of the cabins on the water it seems like that's what she expected when she hugged Sherry goodbye as she left. But it only became clear later that night that there was no cabin, they were camping. And not only were they camping, they were doing so on the edge of a cliff, literally sleeping in a hammock hung between two trees. There's a photo of this hammock that was later taken by investigators and it literally looks as if they are hanging over the edge of the cliff. It was like, if it was to break, you'd just fall straight down. I mean, I think it's just the perspective of the photo. I didn't think it was quite like that, but it wasn't somewhere that I'd want to sleep, that's for sure. But I'm jumping ahead of myself a bit, let's talk about the first couple of days of the festival. So it seems they arrived on the 24th of July 2015 and the first night went without incident. The second day was the 25th on which the group drank throughout most of the day. This was a festival, it's to be expected. Chris and Aaron are apparently known to be thrill seekers and that day they all decided to go cliff jumping off the steep cliff surrounding Centre Hill Lake. And this was pretty dangerous because these cliffs weren't just like sharp drop-offs into the water. You kind of had to throw yourself off and away from the cliff to reach the water without hitting the rocks on the cliff side as you went down. But when Lauren came to jump, she didn't quite do it right and it said that she hit the back of her head on one of her jumps. It's not entirely clear whether she hit herself on one of the rocks on the cliff or one of the rocks in the water, but witnesses would apparently later report to Sherry that she might have even knocked herself out for quite a few seconds. Maybe she had concussion. But by later that night, she seemed completely fine. We know that because Lauren actually ran into one of her old high school friends, Cassie, on the dock, and that night they would all be in the bar together drinking. This was a bar called Fish Lips on the marina. Cassie had gone to Wakefest with Samantha, the friend who Lauren was originally meant to go with, and Cassie said that whilst Lauren was definitely drunk, like everyone was drunk that night, she wasn't paralytic, like she still had some awareness about her. Cassie says that her and Lauren chatted for ages and Lauren made it completely clear that she had zero romantic interest in Chris. She was just putting up with him for Hannah's sake and actually seems like Lauren found him a bit annoying actually. Like it was enough that Lauren asked Cassie if she could come back and stay with her and her group that night, but Cassie responded saying they just didn't have any space. And I'm sure this is something that Cassie has regretted every single day since, knowing what would come to happen. It has since been explained that they were staying on a boat and they were already two people over capacity, so I don't think this was a case of there not necessarily being room for Lauren to stay, but maybe more of a weight issue, I'm assuming, and probably giving the benefit of the doubt a bit as well. Apparently that night there was a bit of drama surrounding Cassie being at the bar at Fish Lips. So Hannah was in a relationship with Aaron, but Aaron just so happened to be Cassie's ex-boyfriend. And at the bar that night, several drinks in, Cassie started to warn Hannah about Aaron. Their relationship had allegedly been physically abusive. Aaron had attacked Cassie on more than one occasion, once even ending up with them both getting arrested. And so Cassie was just kind of trying to be like, girl, watch out. But of course, Hannah didn't take that too well. And this ended in a physical altercation between the two girls, Hannah hitting Cassie whilst Aaron just looked on. Suffice to say, tensions were pretty high. And I do wonder if Lauren maybe felt a bit trapped between these two, two of her friends fighting. But as you'll come to see, Lauren wasn't really involved in this because she was with other friends. But the group stayed at the bar drinking until about 2 a.m. on the 26th before heading off to bed. But like I said, they were camping at the top of a cliff. To get there, they had to canoe across the lake and then hike up over the rocks and through the trees, holding onto a rope that led them to the top. And this is literally 2 a.m. Let me set the scene for you a bit here. So the area they were staying at was a long skinny peninsula sticking out into the lake. On three sides, they were surrounded by water. I get the feeling that this area was a bit of a sort of rite of passage place to stay. Cassie talks about staying there herself a few years earlier and she said it was terrifying. She would literally never ever do it again. Either side of this peninsula were steep cliffs. One side was 90 foot high and the other was 45 foot high. So pretty intimidating. You were literally on a rock, cliffs either side, horrible. I would never. 
And there was nothing there apart from the camping equipment for the friends that night. There was one tent that was quickly grabbed by Hannah and Aaron and a singular hammock that I mentioned earlier, loosely tied between two trees, dangerously close to the cliff's edge. Lauren was braver than I, that's for sure, because one look at this and I would have been swimming back to shore. Like I wouldn't even entertain getting into this hammock. I'd be terrified to even try and enter it for fear of just like flipping over and falling down the cliff's edge. I mean, on this cliff, there wasn't even a toilet. If you needed to go to the loo, apparently the dumb thing was just to hang onto a tree and lean backwards so the pee just ran down the cliff side. All in all, this whole situation was incredibly dangerous. And it would be dangerous enough when you were there sober during the day, let alone drunk and in the dark. So Lauren slept in the hammock with Chris. Again, as I said, there was nothing going on between them. It was just kind of the only option available. The couple certainly didn't want them in their tent with them. They both got into the hammock and according to the stories the group would later tell, nothing eventful happened. They just went to sleep. Chris would later say that he did wake up at one point in the night and in his half asleep state noticed that Lauren was gone, but he didn't think anything of it. It wasn't until the morning they really realised that she had actually disappeared. I do find it hard to believe that he wouldn't have woken up to her getting out of the hammock in the middle of the night. I mean, there's no way to do that gently or gracefully, but he was drunk, they all were, so I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. He says he doesn't know what time it was that she got up. Now you would think that when the three friends woke up in the morning and realised that Lauren was nowhere to be found, they'd panic, but they just didn't. They said they assumed they should have already gone to the festival without them, despite the fact that all of her belongings were still underneath the hammock where she'd placed them. Her phone, her keys and her shoes. Even if Lauren did get up in the middle of the night to go and pee and just happened to fall off the cliff in the process, surely you'd just slip your flip-flops on before you went and you'd bring your phone for the torch or the flashlight as she would have called it. You don't just go wandering around in the dark on your own on the top of a cliff. Hannah later made a voluntary statement to the police which read, when we woke up this morning, Lauren was gone, but all of her stuff was still on the campsite. We thought she might be at Wakefest, but she wasn't there. We immediately went to the campsite when coming back to the dock. She wasn't up there still, but her stuff was. I went to see if she might have been at the Patesford bar and I saw that policemen were already headed to our campsite. At no point in that whole morning did any of her friends report Lauren as missing to the authorities or even to the staff at the festival. It seems that for the most part, they just went on with their day, which isn't something I can really fathom myself as a complete warrior slash panicker, but I do know some people are a bit more free, so maybe giving Hannah the benefit of the doubt, she did assume that Lauren had gone off with other friends, like she had loads and loads of friends at Wakefest that weekend. Maybe she genuinely just wasn't worried. They were all adults at the end of the day and Lauren could go off with other friends if she wanted to, but maybe I'm just being very generous. I'll share Chris and Aaron's statements with you a bit later in the episode as they are very interesting, but first I want to talk about the sad discovery of Lauren's body. As I said, the friends just continued on with their day, joining the festival as normal. It wasn't until around 4.20pm on the 26th of July that Lauren's body was discovered by two fishermen floating face down in a cove. It had been over 12 hours since she was last seen. They, of course, immediately notified the authorities, and very interestingly, the cove in which Lauren was found was fairly close to the shore, but on the opposite side of the peninsula than the group was staying on. So at this point in time, the only people who were aware of a body in the marina were the two fishermen, a father and a son, and two police officials, Chris Yarchuk and Ryan Melanson. Both of them were reserve police officers, a patrolman and a sergeant, and they were with White County, who were working private security at the festival that weekend. So as soon as they found this body, they were the first people to be notified. After the fishermen, they were the first ones on this scene, but they knew that this wasn't actually their jurisdiction. They were just there working as private security that weekend. So they couldn't be the ones to remove the body from the water. However, they're still officers. They started mentally noting things about this scene just in case this was going to become a criminal investigation. And Yarchuk said he was so sure this was going to be a criminal investigation because immediately nothing about this seemed correct to him. 
He said the first thing he noticed was that Lauren was floating on the water. Generally, not always, but generally with drowning cases, the body will sink. He would later tell Crime Watch Daily that he noticed trauma and blood on the back of her head and on the back of her left shoulder. He also notices what he thought was a bite mark on her chest, and he would later suggest that the investigation team do a rape kit. Spoiler alert, they never do. And then something wild happened. As the officers assessed this scene, two young men in a canoe paddled over, shouting that their friend was missing, and they wondered if that was her body. Now this was immediately odd to the officers who thought it was one hell of a coincidence that they would be on this scene so quickly when no one else knew of a body being here and they seemed so concerned when no one had been reported as missing. The boys in question of course were Aaron and Chris. Yarchuk and Melanson would be the first ones to speak to Aaron and Chris as they sailed over in their canoe and they actually got them onto their pontoon boat and said they were acting really, really strange. Apparently when they first got onto the pontoon boat with the officers, Aaron told Chris to shut up, saying, I will tell them the story, don't say anything, which in itself is a massive red flag, very, very odd behaviour. But that wasn't even the worst bit. Melanson would later say, at one point he was looking at my sidearm. I asked, what are you thinking over there? He said, I'm thinking how I'm going to get that gun off your hip and get off this boat. I said, that is not going to happen. About 10 minutes later, he said it again. He wanted off that boat. Imagine saying such a thing to an armed police officer. Like how brave and stupid you have to be to threaten to take their gun. It's absolutely bizarre. Also, when Melanson says he, I'm not entirely clear which man he's talking about, I'm not sure if this was Chris or Aaron, but regardless, either way, it's really strange behaviour. They should be panicking that their friend that they've gone on this holiday with, this festival with, is now floating face down in the water, they should be absolutely distraught. But instead, they're just threatening police officers or making veiled threats and saying they want to get off this boat. But you sailed over here! Like, you were the ones who came over and, like, made yourself known. What? In the end, the ones to actually remove Lauren's body from the water and to conduct this entire investigation into her death were the DeKalb County Sheriff's Department. And well, as you'll come to see, they didn't really conduct an investigation. They did very briefly question Hannah, Aaron and Chris, but that's about the full extent of it. I've already shared with you Hannah's statement, but I do also want to share with you Chris's and Aaron's statements about that morning and Lauren's disappearance because they are absolutely bizarre. They tell a very interesting story, very different to what Hannah shared in her statement. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it does feel to me like they're immediately trying to point the finger elsewhere, but I'll let you decide. So Chris's statement reads, last night the girl, not even her name, Lauren is just the girl to him, came to our campsite for a few minutes saying she was going back to her ex-boyfriend, hung out very shortly and then I fell asleep and woke up and she was gone. Now, I'm not entirely sure what this next bit says, his writing really isn't very good, but it seems to say, I spoke to her ex this morning and he said she came back after we left and was trying to get with him the night after we'd seen her at camp. He said she was trying to make out with him in front of his new girlfriend and then he walked away. Aaron's statement said something along the same lines. It said, Laura and I saw last when we were coming back from the bar with our group. She was crying about her ex-boy who I saw the next morning and had said she tried to make a move on him and he refused. Said he last saw her going to houseboat. She was last seen by me, I would say midnight, before Hannah and I got to bed in our tent at the campsite. Sorry, what? So Lauren, who was apparently completely besotted by her boyfriend back home, apparently tried on with her ex-boyfriend that night who was also at Wakefest. Chris says that the ex apparently said that after everyone fell asleep at the camp, Lauren headed back on her own to try it on with him, and Aaron's statement seems to back this up. But there is a podcast about this case called Without Warning, hosted by Sheila Wysocki, who is the private investigator later tasked with solving Lauren's case, and I would highly recommend listening to this podcast if you want a complete deep dive into this case. Episode 11 of Without Warning is called The X-Files, in which Sheila takes a look at the situation around the ex-boyfriend, who was called Clint, and he was indeed also at Wakefest that weekend with some family members and his new girlfriend. According to Samantha, Lauren's friend who Sheila interviews for this episode, 
Lauren did say multiple times during that day that she wanted to go and find Clint to talk some things out, but there's no evidence that she actually did this. And certainly there's no evidence that she wanted to get back together with him. It seems like there was just some loose ends maybe she wanted to tie up. Lauren spent most of that Saturday night in the bar in Fishlips with a friend called Evan who just happened to be Clint's cousin and a very good friend of hers. He's the person who knew Lauren's demeanor best that night and he was actually the one buying Lauren her drinks. He has said that she was not that intoxicated that evening, she could hold her alcohol really well and she wasn't acting that drunk. Of course she would have been tipsy, she had had a few drinks, but she wasn't blind drunk. Evan spent that entire evening with Lauren and he made no mention of Lauren and Clint talking at any point or having any altercation at all. In fact, he said he made a conscious effort that night to make sure they didn't interact. Clint was there with his new girlfriend and Evan just didn't want any drama. Evan also very interestingly said that the group that Lauren was staying with, so Hannah, Aaron and Chris, weren't anywhere to be seen for a huge chunk of the night. So even if Lauren and Chris did have an altercation, how were they going to know about it? Sheila also spoke to Clint personally for the podcast and he says that on the Friday night, Lauren did try and speak to him, but he just walked away. There, there was no big drama, he just didn't want to get into it and so he walked away. And then he said they had no interaction at all on the Saturday. Their paths didn't even cross, even though they were in the same bar. They just kept away from each other. Clint also has multiple alibis for that night, so multiple people who can back up his version of events. After leaving the bar, him and Evan apparently went to hang out with a whole other group of people, and then they went back to their own RV to sleep. At no point did Clint speak to Lauren on the Saturday night, which makes Aaron and Chris's statements incredibly odd and very out of place. They're both saying the same thing, but nobody else at all can back up their version of events. It's almost as if they made up and discussed it. They back each other up. But this information doesn't come from a police interview, this just comes from Sheila interviewing them for the podcast. I wish I could tell you that both Clint and Evan were interviewed in the aftermath of Lauren's death, but they weren't. Especially Evan, he was the last person to see Lauren before she left to go back to the cliff with her group. But no one spoke to him, nor did anyone speak to Clint. There was no investigation done here. Surely the most basic thing to do in a police investigation when a woman has mysteriously turned up dead is interview the ex-boyfriend, for one, and interview the last person to see her alive before she left with this very suspicious group of people. But no, just didn't happen. Let's talk about Lauren's family. So Lauren's body was found in the cove at 4.20 p.m., but her family weren't informed until quite a bit later. It's a little bit confusing, but it does seem like the family, including Lauren's mum, sister, and boyfriend, were informed that something had happened to Lauren and they went to the hospital to await further news. It was only once they got to the hospital that Sherry gets the news from a DeKalb County Sheriff's deputy that Lauren had actually not made it. Sherry has said the very first question that she asked was where were the people that Lauren was with? To which the deputy replies, they're currently being questioned, but they would very soon be let go. Sherry was also told that it was probably for the best that she didn't see her daughter's body, which very well could have been to protect her. Lauren's body had been in the water for a significant amount of time and no doubt there would have been bloating, it wouldn't have been a very pretty sight. But off the bat, this made Sherry suspicious. If she wanted to see her daughter, shouldn't she be allowed? So from the get-go here, Sherry is immediately thinking like, something is wrong, something is up. Like, why has my daughter suddenly died? And why does nobody seem to think there's anything going on here? So let's talk about the autopsy results, which are incredibly interesting. And when they came out, it only became more clear to Sherry that something was going on. Despite being found face down in the lake and the officials at the scene assuming this was a drowning accident, Lauren's cause of death was actually found to be blunt force trauma to her neck and back. The incident report states that this was caused by her falling down the cliff and then she possibly drowned once she reached the water, but there was no water found in her lungs. It is possible for somebody to drown without water being found in the lungs, but it is incredibly rare. Her cause of death though, it was blunt force trauma, like there's no denying that, that is what the autopsy says. Interestingly though, the post-mortem photos do show that Lauren did have scratches and cuts and bruises in different places on her body, but nowhere near as much as you'd expect if she had fallen, rolled down an entire cliff face. Lauren was also found to have a very high level of alcohol in her body, which is no surprise as we know she was out of the bar drinking on the night of her death. 
but the blood alcohol level was found to be more than twice the legal limit. This has been used as proof that she could have lost her balance and slipped down the cliff, but there are witnesses, Evan, who spent the whole night with Lauren at the bar and have said that she wasn't that drunk. I mean, she was drunk for sure, but not that drunk. There have been questions about whether the medical report recognised the potential for fermentation of alcohol in the body post-death, which could have caused raised levels in the test. And this is something that genuinely happens, but whether it happened in Lauren's case, we don't know. Nobody really looked into any of these things. Detective Jeremy Taylor with the DeKalb Sheriff's Office was the one to lead this case and he wrote, After the autopsy report was completed, I reviewed my case file and the autopsy report and concluded that Lauren Agee's death is consistent with an accident. At this time, I do not have any evidence to support foul play in the death of Lauren Agee. They believe that she accidentally fell down the cliff, perhaps when she got up in the night to go and pee and that was it. However, when the news of this was released, Yarchuk and Melanson, the first two officers on the scene, both felt so strongly that something was amiss that they each independently tried to contact Sherry to let her know that something didn't feel right. Yarchuk has said that from the moment he saw Lauren's body, he knew this wasn't drowning. She was floating. Just nothing about this felt correct. At the scene, he also noticed a large number of marks on Lauren's body that just didn't seem to be mentioned in the autopsy report, despite the photos clearly showing them there. For example, her neck showed signs of hemorrhaging, marking which seemed to be consistent with being held down by the throat. She had bruises on the top of her thighs as if somebody had held her down with their knees. She had broken fingers consistent with somebody putting up a fight. Yarchuk also noticed a bite mark on her chest and commented at the scene that he thought a rape kit should be administered. However, of course, that did not happen, nor was Lauren even swabbed for DNA. And this is the thing that fills me with the most rage in this case, the fact they didn't even bother to do a rape kit. There was no reason not to do one, but you know what the investigating officer Jeremy Taylor stated as his reason for not ordering one? because Lauren was wearing a tampon. And apparently, if a woman is wearing a tampon, she can't be raped. If she's on her period, she can't be raped. Once again, men's poor understanding or poor care of the female anatomy causes a case to go under investigated. A woman can be raped or sexually assaulted whether or not they have a tampon in, whether or not they're on their period. It's not something that's gonna stop a rapist. If there is something that even resembles a bite mark on Lauren's chest, why would they not run a kit just in case? It's beyond comprehension. Like, why would you not want to just make sure? Why wouldn't you swab for DNA just in case? Like, they didn't even check under her fingernails. The pure rage I felt when I read that for the first time, when I read Detective Taylor stating that Lauren couldn't have been raped because she had a tampon in. Oh my God, I could have screamed. I was so angry. The final thing that Yarchuk remembered noting at the scene was a triangular mark on Lauren's torso just underneath her chest. This looked to be an imprint, it was two lines meeting at a point at a 45 degree angle. And he very quickly realised that the markings were very similar to the tip of a canoe. It seemed to him that Lauren's body had been laid over the end of a canoe, her head, arms and sort of chest in the canoe, and her legs sort of dangling over the edge into the water. Like it was quite a deep imprint and it was quite a distinctive imprint as well. Like Yarchuk immediately knew what he was looking at. And there's no denying that these markings were actually there because the DeKalb investigators were eventually forced to release a statement to Crime Watch Daily when they asked for clarification. Their statement said, the Tennessee Wildlife Resource Agency assisted the Sheriff's Department detectives in loading the body onto a TWRA boat to transport the body back to our boat ramp. Our investigation determined this marks an identical match to the TWRA boat storage locker lid where the body was placed face down during transport to the boat ramp. But as has been pointed out, the corner of this boat storage locker lid would have been a right angle, 95 degrees. The mark on Lauren's body was definitely more of a 45 degree angle. There are photos of this available to the public, so I'll let you make up your own mind as to what you think here. But again, it does seem to match a canoe. Even with just a cursory understanding of this investigation, it was pretty clear to Lauren's family that something was amiss here. From day one, they just didn't buy the accident theory. And as more and more information came out, it only confirmed their suspicions. I suppose you could argue that it's confirmation bias that her family are looking for certain details and so they find them. But I do think it's pretty clear that a proper investigation just didn't take place in this case. 
maybe a lot of the family's questions could have been answered if somebody took the time to actually answer them, but nobody did. The falling down the cliff theory just didn't make sense, it still doesn't, and we'll explore why in more detail in just a second, but I do want to go back and talk some more about Lauren's friends, Hannah, Aaron and Chris, because in the days after her death, they made some very questionable moves. On the day that Lauren disappeared, we know they just continued to party like nothing had happened. They didn't report her as missing to anyone. Sure, maybe they did really think that she had just gone off with her other friends, like God knows she knew plenty of people at Wakefest, but as the day went on and they spoke to more and more of the friends and realized that no one had seen her, surely alarm bells would have started ringing, but apparently not. There were a couple who lived on the lake called Harry and Dina Elder, who spoke to Crime Watch Daily about their memories of that weekend, and they shared something incredibly interesting. They said that after the police released the boys on the Sunday, they headed back over to the cliff immediately, and then the couple spotted a fire. Now, of course, this could have just been your standard campfire, but there are items of Lauren's that have never been retrieved, some of her clothes that seem to just go missing and you can't help but wonder if maybe they were burned that night. But it was a post on Chris's Instagram the day after the murder that really made Sherry's blood run cold. After the group returned home from Wakefest on the Monday, because they didn't leave immediately after this, like they partied all day and then left the next day as planned, Chris uploaded an Instagram photo with the caption, best weekend ever. I wish I was joking, I am not. One of the girls you spent the weekend with, a girl you literally shared a hammock with, has suddenly and tragically died, but you had the best weekend ever. I know Laura and Chris didn't know each other going into the weekend, I know they weren't exactly close, but how little empathy do you have to have to be able to do this? Like if I went to a festival for a weekend and someone I met that weekend suddenly died whilst I was there, I would be devastated, I'd be shaken to my core, I wouldn't be able to go on with my weekend, let alone upload a post to Instagram the next day about it being the best weekend ever. When I heard that bit of information for the first time, my mouth literally dropped, I couldn't believe it. And he did eventually change the caption once he undoubtedly got a bit of heat for it, but it wasn't much better. Just the pure audacity, best weekend ever, the girl you shared a hammock with for two nights has mysteriously died. And Sherry also says that none of the three came to Lauren's funeral. Perhaps it's understandable that maybe Aaron and Chris didn't come, I mean Chris clearly didn't care, but Hannah was Lauren's friend since childhood, they had grown up together. The fact that neither Hannah nor her parents came was absolutely shocking to Lauren's family. From early on, the family just weren't happy with the official version of events because there were still so many questions that had to be answered. So Sherry hired a private investigator called Sheila Wysocki, and in the years since, Sheila has gone through every single aspect of this case with a fine tooth comb. She is the host of the podcast that I mentioned earlier without warning, all of which is more investigation than it seems the actual police ever did. And Sheila believes that foul play was involved. She believes that Lauren's body was placed where it was found after she already died. When coming to this conclusion, there are two main things that Sheila points to. The currents of the lake on the day in question and multiple dummy tests that they've conducted in the years since. So Lauren and her friends were camping on the north side of the peninsula that weekend, but her body was found in the water to the south side. Let's say that Lauren did indeed get up in the middle of the night to go and pee, leaving her shoes and phone behind. In doing so, she slipped and ended up falling down the cliff edge and ended up in the water. If this is what happened, she was very likely to have chosen to pee near to her campsite on the north side. Why would she venture all the way over to the other side just to pee? So if she fell into the water, she likely would have fallen to the north, not to the south where she was found. The records of the lake's currents that day show that the currents would have naturally pushed her even more north towards the marina, and that's where she would have been found if she fell near her campsite. But no, she was found hidden away in a cove on the south side. Even if she did fall on the south side, her body wouldn't have been taken to this point by the currents, she still would have been taken north towards the marina. 
It seemed like this is where her body had been placed in a quiet cove with little current, just hidden away. As I said, they've also conducted numerous dummy tests over the years. 50 times they have thrown a dummy of Lauren's weight and size off the cliff at several spots near the campsite. And not on one single occasion did the dummy make it to the water. Each and every time the dummy would get caught on the thick rocks and trees coming to a natural stop before it hit the water. And this makes sense because whilst it was cliffs each side of the peninsula and they did indeed go cliff jumping that weekend, like I said, these weren't sheer drops. It was a steep angle, but not a sudden drop. When cliff jumping, you had to find the exact right spot and then push yourself outwards away from the rock. Something that Lauren didn't do correctly because we know that she already hit her head. So if Lauren did go to pee that night and just fell backwards, rolling down the steep angle of the cliff, the likelihood of her actually reaching the water was incredibly slim, let alone her ending up hidden away in that cove. And there's also the fact that whilst there were injuries on her body, some bruises and grazes and a couple of cuts, it was nothing like you'd expect if you'd literally rolled down a cliff. You'd be covered in abrasions, but Lauren just wasn't. So you can definitely see why Lauren's family are still screaming for answers in this case, but this isn't an open case, this is closed. As far as the officials are concerned, there's nothing more to be done, there's no criminal case here. But of course, that didn't stop Sherry trying to pursue a civil case, a wrongful death suit against not only Hannah, Aaron and Chris, but also a guy called Brixner, whose name I didn't see pop up in this case at all until these legal documents. It's very unclear to me if he was just somebody who hung around with the group that weekend, or maybe he was responsible for setting up the camp, I'm not really sure, but his name is on all the documents. Sherry filed this lawsuit in December 2016 for $10 million, but she said it has never been about the money, she just wants to find out the truth. As part of this suit, all the defendants had to be interviewed, and each and every one of them pled the fifth. They refused to speak for fear of incriminating themselves. Now this is totally reasonable to do so, and it's totally within their rights to do it, and in a way I understand why they would do this, but when there's so many eyes on you, so many people thinking that you're guilty of something, wouldn't you want a chance to set the record straight, to tell the truth if it is indeed the truth? Maybe that's just me, but if you've got nothing to hide, why not speak? But then in September 2018, it was announced that Sherry was having to drop the lawsuit. A judge had put a gag order on the Without Warning podcast, which was doing incredible things in raising awareness for Lauren's case. And basically, if they continued recording it under the gag order, Sherry would risk being thrown in jail. So it seems like Sherry chose to drop the case in order to continue with the podcast. And then there was a plot twist when the Nashville Court of Appeals overturned the judge's ruling and the lawsuit was allowed to proceed onto a jury trial. So quite clearly, it seems the Court of Appeals did see something in this lawsuit that was worth investigating. And the details around all this are a bit confused online, I really couldn't get it straight because it does seem like at one point the case was also dismissed by the court due to insufficient evidence, but then the Tennessee Court of Appeals then overturned this again. And as far as I'm aware, that is where the lawsuit currently stands, but I couldn't find really any updated articles on this since like 2019, 2020. Just one month after Lauren's death, Hannah and Aaron moved down to Florida and it seems they got engaged. Sheila travelled down there to interview Hannah and in a videotaped interview, she discussed the weekend when Lauren died, where she stated that she did not think Chris had anything to do with it. However, at one point in the interview, Aaron received a phone call from Aaron and although Sheila couldn't hear the whole conversation, she claims that she heard Aaron tell Hannah to stick to the story. So take from that what you will, whether you believe Sheila or not, up to you. To this day, none of these three friends have ever been considered suspects in this case. They have never been arrested, and of course it is innocent until proven guilty. I am not telling you this story to convince you that they've done anything questionable. I'm just telling you the story as it happened. Again, I want to stress they have never been considered suspects, they have never been arrested, they were questioned once and then just let on their way. Sheila's theory is that some form of altercation happened on the cliff that night, that Lauren was harmed by one of the men that she was staying with. Perhaps she did fall at one point and hit her head on a rock in the kerfuffle, perhaps she was fighting back, and she ended up losing her life in the process. We know that Aaron had a history of violence, of domestic violence, Cassie has provided proof to the police of the injuries he caused her whilst they were together, but they never really showed any interest in following this up. Chris also has numerous offences on his record, but they're mostly DUIs. 
In deposition for the lawsuit, Detective Jeremy Taylor was asked under oath what kind of investigation he did into Lauren's death, and he was forced to answer with the truth, which was nothing. The potential crime scene on the cliff was trampled and went completely unprocessed. There were text messages reportedly erased from Lauren's phone. 911 audio was lost, notes weren't taken. Recordings were never made of the interviews. Lots of relevant people were never even interviewed at all. And there wasn't a single DNA test done, not a single swab. In his deposition, Detective Taylor admitted that he'd never worked on a homicide case before and he had no training in such an investigation. When asked why he didn't talk to the people who called 911, he said, I just didn't. He admitted that he didn't know when Lauren was last seen alive, nor did he speak to the residents of the houseboats not far from where her body was found. He didn't think about the direction of the currents and he didn't consult any experts about this either. He didn't collect DNA from under Lauren's fingernails, which could have provided answers as to the potential fight question. And he didn't request a rape kit because Lauren was on her period. His report at the end of his two month long investigation was just three paragraphs long. The DeKalb County Sheriff did concede in July 2018 that Taylor could have gathered more information, but he refused to say that he should have done so. Lauren's death may well have been a tragic, unlikely accident, but with such poor investigation, how are her loved ones supposed to believe that? How can they trust that the officer's gut instincts that it was an accident are correct? So that's what it comes down to, isn't it? With basically no investigation, you're just believing the investigator's best guess at what happened. There was no analysis, there was no looking at every angle. I can't help but feel, had the investigators looked at it a bit closer on the first day, her death may have gone down as more of a question mark. Maybe there isn't enough evidence to actually convict somebody of murder in this case or manslaughter, but there is also plenty to suggest that this was not an accident. We have seen closed, solved cases like this one get reopened with just a bit more media pressure. It is possible, and I think that's what Lauren's family are hoping for in this case. All they want is a solid answer. I think either way they'll be happy, as long as there is evidence to back this up. But like I said at this moment, you're just trusting the officer's gut instincts that this was an accident, because even the autopsy results said that this was blunt force trauma. She didn't drown. Sure, maybe it was caused by her falling down the cliff. She may well have been dead by the time she reached the water. But also, why has no dummy ever reached the water? Like, what is the truth here? I think this is gonna be a pretty controversial one and I can't wait to hear all of your feedback in the comments down below. What do you think is the most likely answer here? Do you think this case should be looked at again? Thank you so much for tuning in today and I will see you in the next one. Bye guys.